Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Breaking Monero. Today, we have a much simpler topic than the last two episodes, at least. Just the idea of an unusual ring size. This should be a pretty short episode for you all today. We already spoke about what Monero's ring signatures are, so make sure to go watch those episodes if you haven't seen them yet. But instead, we're simply covering how Monero's ring size has sort of changed and how, as a result, you can't really send transactions with unusual ring sizes anymore. So to begin with, we're going to start with a brief history lesson. And to help aid us with this, uh, there's this one contributor called Stofu who has a real fantastic tool over here in regards to Monero's, uh, the ring size of Monero transactions over time. So you can see back when Monero was first started, that most of the transactions, you know, there about 98% of them had a ring size of, of one in that you did not hide the output at all. There, there was essentially no ring signature. And as we increase the minimum, as you can clearly see here, that the minimum became three. So as a result, most became ring size three, and then five, and then seven, and now 11. But as you can see, going up to this process, it wasn't that everyone only used one specific number. So you can see here, for example, on June 30th, 2017, that sure, most transactions used ring size three, but there were several other transactions that were sent. As an example here, there were 130 transactions on that day, about 5% that sent transactions with ring size 11. And this was one of the options in the GUI, so you can tell the GUI wallet software. So it was more likely to, for someone to use a ring size of 11 than a ring size of 14, let's say. But if we zoom in on the current history, if we go in just to the recent day, we can see that now ring size 11, which is the current ring size of Monero, is the only transaction size that people can use. No, it's not just the case that coincidentally everyone's sending transactions this way. It's actually mandated on the network that you send trans transactions this way, that you actually have a mandatory ring size now. So this is a little bit of just, you know, history going back. And so uh, hopefully this tool, if you want to play around, Stoko has a ton of great data too on their website. You can see the link just up there. So a lot of cool data there even beyond just Monero ring sizes for whatever you're interested in, but just warning that it will destroy your browser window as you're trying to use them. Just a uh, fair warning to everyone who's trying to set this up for the first time. All right, but um, I, as far as late introductions here, I apologize, but um, yep, I'm Justin, here's always. And just like always too, we have Serang over there. Wave Serang. Hey. Excellent. Um, so do you want to talk about some of the the sort of crazy outliers we had with Monero rings in the past and, and sort of what people were doing there? Yeah, so I mean, as you kind of pointed out, um, up until very, very recently, um, the ring size was not fixed. So there were minimum ring sizes established. The minimum originally was one because you had to send something, um, which has effectively meant the ring signatures were more or less optional. And as you said, that that minimum has increased over time, but that was just a minimum. Um, so in the wallet software, you could choose in theory, any ring size that you wanted. Um, and then your wallet software would choose, you know, approximately that many decoys along with your real, uh, your real sent output and generate a transaction with it. Um, and then different wallets, of course, could kind of make their own decisions on, you know, what they wanted to offer as kind of fixed options. As you pointed out, some wallet software, you know, while it would let you choose any ring size if you really wanted to, would also offer kind of some preset options to kind of make things easy for you. But some folks definitely have had some outliers um, when they, you know, presumably wanted to increase their privacy a great deal. We discussed before <laughs> before we recorded, discussed a couple of interesting ones, uh, one of which was, looks like on October 10th, 2018, um, that was you know greater than 100, for example. Um, but I think kind of the biggest standout that you would notice, I think you actually have a, a screen to show for this one, was in April 2017, um, which had, as far as I have seen, one of, if not the greatest ring sizes of all time um, at 4,501. So, yeah, I, I, can, I can pull that up and just show people that uh, yeah. really briefly. Um, you can so, just see on this example Block Explorer page here that you had a mix in of 4,500, so a ring size of 4,501. So this is a, a quite large ring size. Remember that at the time, uh, this, this was in April 2017, so the default was either five or seven. So this was... <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it's pretty crazy. And and remember, you know, the way the ring signatures work, among those 4,501 outputs that occurred in that signature, only one of them was the truly spent output. You know, absent external information, we don't know what it is. Uh, we noticed as we did a little bit of digging in there, a lot of the uh, a lot of the decoys that presumably decoys that were used in that transaction actually had ring size one, and so would have been you know trivially vulnerable to the whole zero mix in and and possibly leading to a chain reaction attack. So, and as we talked about when we talked about our output selection algorithm, you know, there's more to it than just ring size when it comes to safely building a transaction. But those are kind of some interesting standouts, um, you know, and, and and of course, why why this is why this can be a problem um, is has to do with fingerprinting. Um, and the idea of fingerprinting is that if your wallet software behaves, you know, abnormally or in any way that kind of stands out when it's generating a transaction, an adversary can kind of use that as a heuristic to try to figure out what software you're using. Does that break your privacy immediately? Well, no, not necessarily. Um, but at the same time, the goal is for everyone to kind of blend in uniformly. So, you know, if you, if you decide for whatever reason to, you know, have ring size 69, because, you know, that's the thing you want to do, then presumably someone could look at the chain and be like, oh, a transaction with ring size 69. Ah, it must be that one ring 69 guy. Does that tell who you are? Not necessarily, but it does make you stand out. Um, and we even see different wallet software over time that's kind of giving users options that presumably was to you know, offer them different levels of privacy. Presumably in those cases, a smaller ring would have meant lower privacy and a larger ring could have meant higher privacy. Um, but of course that's not necessarily the case, right? Um, we do know that if wallet software offers different values for those options than other wallet software, that's a method to fingerprint what wallet you were using. You know, and of course there's much more that goes into what you know, determines you know, the level of effective privacy of a ring than just its ring size. Now, of course, we have a fixed mandatory ring size of 11, which means a real input and, you know, 10 decoys. And that's no longer a minimum. You know, the, regardless of what your wallet software tries to do, if it tries to broadcast a transaction with any number besides that, the network will reject it and it will not be added to the blockchain, which is why when you looked at that, that graphic earlier, we saw that 100% of transactions since that fork or upgrade date now have that precise ring size. And that's a good thing. You know, will we ever consider raising the ring size in the future? If we see a definite user benefit, yes, we will consider that. But there are trade-offs. So, you know, absent all other information, in theory, having a larger ring size in the absence of other information, you know, can be better for your privacy. Why? Because a ring signature guarantees that, you know, one out of however many outputs are in your ring are the true signer. And again, absent external information but it tends to be more complicated in practice. For example, we saw in our previous episode on the output selection algorithm, we know that that can be a little bit complicated. If you choose those decoys poorly, for example, that can start to leak a little bit of heuristic information to an adversary. And there's other forms of analysis that are a bit less sensitive to that, for which just purely increasing the ring size might not give you as much benefit as you want. And there are downsides, right? If we choose to have a larger ring size, well, that means that the transactions become bigger, the blockchain bloats faster, depending on our fee model, it could yield higher fees. And it means that it's also slower to sync the blockchain over time. And that could discourage people from running full nodes. So it's kind of this you know, large, large scale effect if we were to do that. Do we get better privacy? According to some models, yes. But according to other models, not necessarily. So kind of the big motto behind all of this, I think, is that our goal is to make sure that every transaction to the extent possible blends in with every other transaction. If there's a way that a transaction can stand out, if that could allow any kind of fingerprinting or leak of information, we want to avoid it. You know, researchers and developers in the Monero community decided that allowing for larger ring sizes, while it could have some marginal benefit, you know, was outweighed by the fact that that could allow fingerprinting and in general, just standing out from other transactions. And that because of that, we decided to go to a fixed ring size. So we really wanna make it fairly difficult for people to make choices that are unsafe for them and other people. And I think that this was one way in which we were able to help that. To give a brief example of that, suppose that I was paying Serang for, for any any reason, <laughs> right? And say say I want to buy Serang's cool coffee mug there, right? He sells coffee mugs, okay? Suppose that Serang was really concerned about your privacy and that you said, okay, any payments sent to me must have a ring size of this number or greater because I want the most privacy possible when I'm receiving payments. So suppose Serang just goes off the wall. He says, if you're sending me a transaction, you need to send me a transaction with the ring size 100 or greater. Well, there aren't that many people that are sending transactions with those ring sizes, so you could 
fingerprint essentially by looking at, at the blockchain data and say, okay, this is a uh, this is a transaction that meets Serang's merchant store minimum requirement of 100. So there's a, I mean, there's a greater chance this transaction went to him than any other transaction with a smaller ring size. So it was really balancing those sort of things. It, it's it's weird because on one hand you can go to one strict extreme where you can say that. Any like any larger ring size is better. Like I, I can send a ring size of five, uh, a transaction with a ring size of ten or one hundred. Why shouldn't I send with one hundred? It's larger. And then you can go to the other extreme that says, well, you're exposing more information. And really, in for reality's purpose, it's it's kind of somewhere between the two. And we need to manage fingerprinting against actual size and, and use cases and other things like that. Yeah, increasing the ring size, you know, according to some forms of analysis can be very beneficial, but you end up paying for it in other ways. So there's always a balance and we have to try to meet that balance at any point in time as best we can. And that's what we do. Great, Serang. Any last closing thoughts that you have on this, this short topic here? We turned it up to 11, man. Excellent. Well, thanks. Thanks again for joining me, Serang. And thanks for watching this very brief episode today. We'll have others coming up for you later. Take care and have a great rest of your day. See ya. Bye.